Welcome to the AB 1611 Hour. Today I'm going to preach on children's children. Um, this sermon is being preached at the request of one of the members of the church who will obviously have to hear it on the live stream or whatever they call it on the internet afterwards. But there was a request made to talk about what the Bible says about children and having children and those things. And this is something I never really preached on at all. And I'm going to say right up front that we live in a very different world than the world of three or 400 years ago. You now have available to you all sorts of medical devices and medical options that you can stop nature or thwart nature at any time you feel so inclined. In other words, birth control. Um, back in the old days, there was no birth control, except um, what they would call a rhythm method, I guess, which, you know, or, or the onanism. And I'm not explain to you what that is if you don't know what onanism is. Um, these things aren't unclean topics. They're topics that pertain to life. And as far as human sexuality and birth control go, I'm not going to preach on birth control or when life starts, so I'll reference that. There are numerous passages in the scripture which would take me days and days to explicate completely. And there's many important verses on this topic that when woven together can show God's mind on what God intends for men and women, for husbands and wives to do. What is their primary purpose here in this world? It's to know God and obey him, live for him and enjoy him forever as the Westminster Confession of Faith says in point one. But it's also to obey his commandments. Now, uh, Jesus said in the New Testament, my commandment to you is that ye love one another. And Paul said, he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. And love worketh no ill to its neighbor. And I preached very extensively in different parts on that topic, that we ought to love our fellow man, and we ought to especially love the brothers and sisters in Christ who are one through the Spirit of God with us and believe in Jesus. But I want to ask you, do you know where the first commandment in the Bible is? Can any of you quote it? The very first commandment to man in either testament it occurs in Genesis chapter 1, but I'd rather have you not turn there. Turn to Psalm 127 and verse 3. We'll get to the first commandment in a few minutes. I'm going to lay out God's very first commandment to man, when man and his wife, man and woman, were in a state of innocence. That's very important. If you look at the whole of the Bible, and the first thing and the only commandment given to man in a state of innocence is one thing, is to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. It's to replenish, refill the earth with mankind. Now, I'm not telling you here dogmatically that there are humans on earth before the earth was created, but possibly the earth was somehow populated and then destroyed, and it might have been populated with other creatures besides humans. We do not know. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that, put that all aside. That doesn't really matter. What matters is what God told us to do. And what God said is God blessed them, and God said, without the blessing of the Lord, you can't have children. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Bring it under subjugation. Rule over it. Rule over the creation. Rule over the beast of the earth, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea. And of course, man in the state of innocence was a vegan. He was a vegetarian. He was given the herb uh, bearing seed after its kind, and the fruit thereof for his sustenance, his maintenance, and his food, his daily food. But... In Psalm 127, verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. We here see that fruitfulness, or the bearing of children, is a particular blessing of God upon his people. Many times in the Bible you'll find barren women that sought the Lord, prayed earnestly, in some cases for years, to be able to even have a son or a daughter at all. And uh, Rachel was withheld from bearing children. And finally, she sought the Lord and strove with the Lord, and he gave her two sons, 
Joseph and Benjamin. And in the bearing of the second son, she died. And it's instructive to note that she had taken her father's gods and hid them in the camel's furniture. And she was barren. There's no um, indication that Leah had done such a thing. God opened her womb and she had many, many children. And these children were what? The heritage or an inheritance from God to the parents, to the wives and to the husbands. And that was how men multiplied and grew upon the face of the earth. And out of that one family, which numbered about 72 people when they were down in Egypt, came a multitudes of people and 12 different tribes that filled the whole nation of Israel and became a mighty people in the face of the earth and were used to bring forth the word of God and Jesus Christ into the world that in all the earth, they might be a blessing to all the men upon the face of the earth. So the birth of children to the people of the Lord is represented as the blessing of God upon those that fear the Lord and walk in his ways. Without exception, we find that the saints of God mentioned in the Bible greatly desire to have children, both literally and spiritually. It is by procreation, that is procreation, do we understand that? What that is, by procreation that one man, Abraham, became the progenitor of numerous nations of people according to the promise of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even the son of the bondwoman, Ishmael, became the father of princes and peoples, simply because he was Abraham's son. The sons of Keturah, Abraham's wife, whom he married after the death of Sarah, by procreation became numerous nations. The birth of children ensured the continuance of the family name and line. The nation of Israel came out of Abraham's loins by the promise of God. So we find that one of the marks of the blessing of God upon a man and his wife is the bringing forth of children and many children. We find that women that were childless strove mightily with God, seeking the blessing of being able to bear little ones unto the Lord. It is instructive as well that the one of the first commands given to Adam and Eve was as follows. Now you can look at that for yourself. If you look in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God made man in his own image. God is a creator, and he gave man and woman together the power to come together and be the cause of the creation of new souls coming upon the earth. Verse 28, And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. This is an absolute commandment of God. The Christians in past generations believe that. But we've been tainted by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and been taught that it's up to us when we have children. Now, I have never, even in the state of being a lost heathen, there are a couple things I did understand. And I understood that children were the fruit of the womb and the heritage of the Lord, that they were the fruit of the loins of man and the womb of a woman, and that God had something to do with that process. And it was his peculiar blessing onto mankind to be able to procreate. I mean, you have a wonderful family. You have a very unique family. You have a family that's been blessed of God. Think if your parents wouldn't have obeyed this injunction and didn't have children, why you wouldn't exist. There is some good in every life brought into the world, and every life brought into the world, be that person growing up to be evil or good, has a purpose in God's sight. This is why I think we all can agree that it's a heinous crime and a sin before Almighty God to thwart the natural processes of human procreation and cause a child in the womb to be killed and brought forth and dismembered in pieces. If my wife's mother had done this, she would not exist. If my mother had done this, I would not exist. There are many things that I could say about my own life that if this intervention of God had not occurred in my life, I would no longer exist. But the Lord intervened in my life repeatedly and gave me life for death in numerous situations where me following in my own instincts, my own sullen, craven, perverted, sinful nature would have got myself killed. 
but God, for his own purpose, chose to keep me alive. Life is a gift of God. And who are we to tell God what he will do with his own? Don't we all belong to the Lord? Yeah, we do. He bought us with a price, so we belong to the Lord way more than the heathens do, in a sense, because he's not redeemed them with his own blood. And even these heathens in the world, they are out multiplying Christian people right now. Because Christianity, Christian people have taught to be selfish, self-centered, and self-focused. I've had the chance to talk to many people in their 20s and 30s. And the statements they make about marriage, about having children, are amazing to me. They've been taught against having children. They don't understand and know that children are an heritage of the Lord and the blessing of God. They've been taught that children are a choice. Um, in olden days, children weren't a choice. They were a necessity. Because a couple to survive and have a thriving farmstead would need to have many children, like the Mennonites and the Amish do. There's no birth control going on there, is there? <laughs> and they have multiple children, and they run huge farms with their children. They teach their children to be workers from their youth up. There's some good traits, some good Christian traits in those people, even if they're not really Christians. They have some good habits. They have a Protestant work ethic. They're descendants of the Anabaptist, who were uh, Protestant rebaptizers. They became very stolid and stodgy in some of their ways, and they have certain traditions that maybe could be said to be outside the Bible, but they don't hinder God and his work. Who am I to tell God that I'm going to put a glove on and not fulfill my purpose here on the earth? Now, there comes a time when every man and every woman will get past the age of being able to have children. And you never know how fast that might happen. Through a, a flaw of nature, through um, a health event, a health crisis in your life, you could end up not being able to bear children. And you don't know when that time is. Or even if you're able to bear children into your early 40s as a woman, and even if you're able to impregnate your wife as a man into your 40s or 50s, you never know when that ability will be taken away. So it's something you ought to use before you lose it. You never know when the Lord might say, well, you've not obeyed me. And this is, I want to bring this up because this is serious business. What are you going to do in the latter end? I sought to fulfill these commands, and because of my own sinfulness and my sins finding me out, it wreaked havoc in my progeny and my children, wreaked havoc in their lives. My sins found me out, and our sins often find us out. Even if we do have children, we see that our sins find out our children and our children's children. But how much the more, if you're a Christian, walking in the light of God, should you not obey this commandment to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the face of the earth? That command of itself has been the cause of Christians in the various nations of the earth when Christianity was strong upon the earth to have five, seven, or even nine children. Why the man that wrote, It is well with my soul. I brought this up previous, I think, not too long ago. I read the story of it. He um, had a wife and four daughters that were coming back from England on a ship. The ship sunk. All four of the little girls were killed, but his wife survived. And he wrote, it is well, it is well with my soul. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Noah had 10 children and God took them all away in one day. And then when God restored Noah to his prosperity and the blessings of God, he gave him 10 more. Either he... Re Either the Lord resurrected those 10 children, or he gave Noah and his wife fecundi, fec, I don't know how I'm in trouble, made them fecund. Fecund is F-E-C-U-N-D. And iti, fecundi, is fruitfulness, the quality of producing fruit, particularly the quality in female animals of producing young in great numbers. The power of producing or bringing forth. Fertility, the power of bringing forth in abundance. Richness of invention. God blesses his people with the ability to reproduce. Sometimes they bear children and the children die. And we have a whole modern paradigm 
in this matrix that's been set up for humankind to live on the earth and die on the earth without God. And they tell you that you have all these choices. And in a sense, you are faced with choices as an adult in this world that 100 years, there were no choices for men and women to make. You know, um, the use of contraception is widespread and encouraged at every turn and corner. By who? By the new world orders, the haters of humanity. You realize what their goal is? Is to reduce mankind to 500 million people. There's over 6 billion now. Now, what ought you to do to thumb your nose at them like that? Bear children. Have Christian children. Raise your children as Christian. Have those children raise children as Christian and stick it in their face. You know, I understand that. See, people regard childbearing as a burden and not a blessing anymore. I know a man that got fixed permanently, and he said, I don't ever want kids. Why would I want to bring children into this world? Why wouldn't you want to bring children into this world? It's a command of God. Man's a professing Christian as well, I might add. But um, failure to take God seriously at his word and scrupulously to obey his commands is one of the sides of the backslidden state of the church and selfishness in the people of God. Instead of viewing children as a blessing and the heritage of the Lord, many look upon childbearing and children as a burden and even take steps to ensure that no offspring will result from the physical aspect of marital relations. That's not what God said to do. He didn't say thwart my purpose. He said bear children. There's only one way to do that. Now, of course, we. oh, that's right, I forgot. We've got artificial insemination now. So that now perverts who are incapable of bearing children with their pervert partners have now gone around God and found out a way to have children and raise perverts like themselves. What Christian person ought you to be doing to fight that evil? Have children and raise them to be Christians and teach them that that kind of behavior is evil in the sight of God. Well, I see, I can get very wound up about this. I've always believed that part of man's purpose on the earth was to fill the earth and for us to multiply and replenish the face of the earth. And it was nature's process and nature's God that gave us this process of having children. There are many blessings that you have from having children, and you see the glory of God in the face of your child when you bring a child into this world. And we're warned that in the last days, men would be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. It's not our talk, but our walk that shows God who we are and what we love. Service to Christ demands sacrifice, a willingness to labor, and pour your life into that of another. It's what your mom and dad did. They poured their lives into you, your sister, and your brother. And it's borne great and mighty fruit. It's made you strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God has handed down blessings to Christian people in the form of children who have then become children of God in their own right and have a standing before God in their own person and are long, not, no longer are dependent on the parents for faith but have a faith that's their own faith, a faith of their own that they live and can die by and do well with. Being a teacher demands much time and preparation for that moment when the teacher stands before young people seeking to impart them the knowledge and ethics necessary to have successful lives and good careers. Being a preacher demands the sacrifice of time to study and pray, and a willingness to put all else aside to excel at the great goal of imparting the word of God to whomsoever will hear. Now, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, and for doctrine, I've got it out of order there, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All scripture is relevant to us and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So certainly the first positive command of God will be instructive to us for doctrine. Now, the lives of the saints in the time of the Bible our lives are sacrificed to the work of the Lord, and the greatest pleasure of these men and women in the Bible is to see the word of God multiply and grow, imparting faith to others who will then do the same. Perhaps I am mistaken, 
But having read the Bible these last 35 years, I can find no example or commands to seek the pleasures of this world while preparing for life in the next world. In fact, I find the contrary. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. That means she that liveth delicately. In fact, Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can any hearing my voice imagine Paul the Apostle describing how he had taken a vacation for the ministry and then recount all the things he saw and did on vacation, how much he enjoyed it? He's our role model. Every journey he took, every place he went, it was a missionary event to save souls. That's a picture of what our lives should be. And if we do go on a rest, on a respite, on a vacation, we ought to be a witness and a testimony to all those people that serve us, wait upon us, and relate to us during that time. That's the great goal, is to live for Jesus Christ, and having lived for him, then die a good death in Christ. The Bible is our standard. We are in a warfare with Satan our whole time on the earth, and we are soldiers of Jesus Christ. And the things of this world are to be used without abusing them, and we be diligent to make our election and calling. Sure, salvation is of the Lord and was brought for us by the suffering and blood of Christ, and not by works of righteousness which we have done. But we are admonished plainly. In Titus 3, verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. I would suggest to you that the good works that are put upon us there are the works of obedience to the words of God. It's only logical, it only makes sense. Right now, the Muslims are outproducing the Christians. The pagans are outproducing the people of God. They're overrunning the people of God in America. Right now, the Roman Catholics from south of the border and the idol worshipers are coming north, and they breathe like flies. And we do nothing to stand in their way to fight them back with the same level of appropriation. And, you know, we talk about races and strains of people. Abraham was so desperate to have a son that he listened to his wife and went in onto the bondwoman, but still he had a son who was by promise and impregnated his wife when she was 90 and he was 99. Now, God hasn't called you to do that, and he's not going to make you able to do that most likely, but he did the miracle to cause the promised seed of Christ to come forth after the flesh. Now, as others fall away from their duties in the kingdom of God, we should press further into the kingdom of God and be bold in Christ. Satan may hinder us. Physical limitations and frailties may stop us from some things. But we are spiritual beings and are commanded to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We ought to consider deeply the position we occupy and look to the pagans and false religionists that multiply in hordes every year. Hordes. We're being overrun by them in this nation. First it's Mexicans, then it's Central Americans. Now it's Haitians. And they're all outbreeding all of us white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people. Why is that? Because for whatever reason, those pagans are obeying God's command in Genesis chapter 1. And we're not obeying those commands like they are. They're overcoming us. They're overtaking us. And you wonder why the country is the way it is? We've left, left off some of our basic duties. Islamic women are not slack in childbearing, neither are the unenlightened pagans. In the face of this, Christian women ought to follow the words of Paul. 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, not have one child, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Look at the implications of that in context of our text for the day. God's called us to great things. For a Christian woman, 
He's given you a power and ability that he's not given a man. He's given you a power to bear children. You have a power that no man on the face of the earth has or ever can have. You're able to hold another life within your body and after nine months bring forth a child unto the Lord. You're able to suckle a child and wean a child and love a child in a way that no man ever will because that child lived in your body. There's a great grace in motherhood and childbearing. Now, I've had occasion to discuss the bearing of children with people in their 20s and 30s. Many in this age group in America have determined not to have children because they are more interested in their own pleasures than being tied down with children. Some state that the things in this country are too bad right now to have children, but there are couples who desire to have a children and sometimes go to great lengths and expense to be able to have a little boy or girl. I know of a couple right now. They can't procreate naturally. So they're going the route and have gone the route of artificial insemination. And it's a very careful process to be able to be impregnated with your husband's living seed, sperm, the Bible calls it seed, and then cause that child to come forth. And they're striving mightily for it and being, taking every care to have one little baby. Now, women of old wrestled with the Lord to have a son, such as Hannah. Rachel begged God in prayer to open her womb. Ladies and gentlemen, the parts of the Bible that rub you the wrong way are the parts you need to seek to obey the most. I always had a trouble with what was in James because I was a big talker. And in James, there's admonitions to shut your mouth and rule over your own mouth and what comes out of your mouth and control your mouth. And the same in Proverbs. Instead of running from those verses in Proverbs that taught that, he that openeth my mouth wide shall have destruction, but he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. I memorize those things to bring my unruly member, my tongue, under subjection to God. Whatever rubs you the wrong way is what you need the most in the Bible. That's my own life. Now, I want to ask you, in the Bible, God's ways aren't our ways. Our ways aren't God's way. But look in the Bible. Is there an example of a saint practicing birth control? Do you know of one? Is there any example of a man seeking not to impregnate his wife? Oh, yes, there is. Onan, turn Genesis 38 for a minute. 38 and verse 8. And find out if the blessing of God was on what Onan did or if the curse of God was upon what Onan did. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her and raise up seed to thy brother. What we find in the Old Testament patriarchs, particularly Judah, that their lives antedated or go before Moses and the law of Moses by 400 years, but they already intuitively, implicitly understand the law of God is given by Moses. That's why when his daughter Tamar play, played the harlot, he said, bring her out and let her be burnt. She played the whore in her father's household. And it turned out she played the whore with Judah. He went in on her thinking she was a prostitute, not knowing it was his own daughter-in-law who'd had two sons killed by God and the third son refused to raise up seed in this instance here. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass that when he went into his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest he should give seed to his brother. And the Lord was very happy that Onan practiced contraception. Is that what it says? No. And the thing he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he, the Lord, slew him also. Killed him. For not raising seed up onto his brother. That was, he was going to impregnate his brother's wife, and the seed would bear the name of his brother and be his brother's family. That's commanded to do in the law. If a man dies and he dies childless, his brother is to raise up seed onto his brother. That was commanded in the law, but Judah understood the law before the law was ever given by divine inspiration. So the only example we have of birth control in the Bible ends with God killing the one that did it. The Lord is pretty plain about what his, his thoughts are on birth control. 
Let this be a warning to some and an admonition to others. We are to love God with all our soul, all our mind, all our strength, and all our heart. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. His commandments are not grievous. I set before you this day the blessing and the curse. It is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in man. You're better to trust God's word than your own thoughts about any matter. There's safety in the Lord. And in the doing of his commandments, the psalmist said there is what? Great reward. There is great reward in the keeping of God's commandments. Um, Psalm 128. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. Thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round thy table. Behold, that thus shall be the man, man that blessed... Thus shall be the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. Children are an heritage of the Lord and a blessing of God. Now, I want to give you a counterposit for a brief moment from Hosea chapter 9. And you could look there. Hosea chapter 9, verse 9, and on down. To verse 16, I preached a whole sermon on this many, many years ago, maybe before you were born or slightly after you were born. And this section in Hosea has to do, Hosea, Daniel, Hosea, it's after Daniel, Hosea. Um, here it says, they have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. What that means is in chapter 19 of Judges, the men of Gibeah were a sodomite warrior tribe who had wives and had some children, but preferred mankind to womenkind. And they were all warriors. They had hundreds of men in the tribe that could sling with their left hand, slingers with a slingshot, and hit something at a hair's breadth. They were expert warriors, and there was a big battle between the sodomite tribe and the other 11 tribes who sought to exterminate them from the face of the earth for their behavior. Not a very popular topic to preach on these days, but it's in the Bible, and we believe the Bible, do we not? But it says here that they've deeply corrupted themselves in the days of Gibeah. This tribe of Ephraim corrupted themselves and followed in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Therefore, God would remember their iniquity. He would visit their sins. He said, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor. Baal Peor means Lord of the Opening. They worshiped the fertility god, Baal, the Lord of the Opening, and separated themselves out of that shame, and their abominations were according as they loved. They engaged in child sacrifice. They engaged in idolatry. Therefore, God said, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. When does life begin? According to God, it begins at the conception. When you conceive, ladies, it's your job to nourish and feed that tiny bit of life that's multiplying and dividing inside your body and care for it. And women do that generally by nature unless they're very depraved, sin-laden women who are perverse in their nature. Women that are like that, that are sin-laden and evil and wicked, They'll drink, they'll smoke, they'll do all kinds of terrible things to their own bodies because they're in bondage and harm the child that's in vitro, that's in the womb. In vitro, I guess that's how they say it. Now, God says, you know, you're evil, you're wicked. You agree with the sodomites? You like their religion? You like their practice? Well, I'm going to cause your glory, your children, to fly away from you like a bird from the womb, from the conception, and from the birth. In other words, they'll die in birth, they'll die in the womb, and they'll be malformed from the conception. God puts a curse on people for idolatry on their procreative powers. Ephraim, as I saw Tyrus, I saw Ephraim, is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. 
Give them, O Lord, what will thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. God curses offspring of people that are disobedient to him and disobey him and walk in idolatry. All their wickedness is in Gil Gilgal, for there I hated them. For the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. Ephraim is smitten. In other words, the life of the tribe of Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. What is the root of the tribe but the procreative power? They shall bear no fruit, yea, though they bring forth. Yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of their womb. A terrible, terrible curse placed upon the tribe of Ephraim. They have become wanderers and dispersed in the nation and would be no more for their idolatry and for the denial of God's word and their refusal to worship him in spirit and truth after receiving the blessing of being one of the 12 tribes of Jacob or of Israel. So, like Moses said to the people in the wilderness, when he gave them the law, he said, I set before you the way of death and the way of life. We need to get back to the Bible. We need to follow the Lord and trust in him and know that he does well and not trust our own selves. I have never believed in the use of contraceptives. In my pagan days, I did it once and I didn't like it. I felt like it was something against nature. It just seemed to thwart nature's progress and process. Not that I was seeking to have children, I wasn't, but when I impregnated my first wife after she became my wife, after she was pregnant out of wedlock, it was positive to me that we did have a choice in the matter. I said, what do you mean? We have no choice. That's a precious life growing inside of your womb. I've never had the heart to kill babies. And none of us here do, I know that. But God has called this one of the biggest blessings you can have in your life. And you never really know what that little boy or girl might become in the Lord. Um, there's some great and mighty men have been born of women that were barren for a long time. There's some men that became very famous, and uh, I think Beethoven was actually the seventh or eighth child, and a lot of his other family members uh, weren't right, but he grew up and he went deaf pretty quick, but he gave the world some of the greatest music that's ever been known. And you never know what's going to happen. And God says, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The ability to procreate and reproduce. It says, they shall not be ashamed. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Those that bear children on the Lord, it says, they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. What does that mean? The enemies of God's people that come into the gate, they will oppose them. They will stand up to them. Not just they, but their children and their children's children. Um, Psalm 113, then I'll be finished. The Lord said this, verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. That's a thing that's found throughout the Bible. Barren women seeking God and coming to have children. It's one of God's great acts that he points to in the New Testament. I mean, he took one man and him as good as dead, the Bible says in Hebrews. Made him a father of nations. One man, Abram, called him out of Ur, the Chaldees. Made him a father of many nations. And in his seed, all the nations of the earth were blessed. It's something to think about. Because I know that this is something that's neglected, not taught. And i got to tell you, uh, I've been derelict in my duty and should have preached this a long time ago. Really should have. But sometimes I assume that things are in the Bible and that you, like I, read the Bible and you see the same things in the same light I do. But we don't ever see things in the Bible in exactly the same light. Some of you have a greater understanding of the parts of the scripture than I probably ever will. There's certain things God's made very real to you in your life and you know better than I can ever know. You've experienced them. 
and likewise myself. I sought to labor in the word and doctrine these past 30, 35 years. I guess it's been since 1986, however long that is. And I find in Christian history and doctrinal writings that what I've preached today conforms to the sound doctrine and the word of God preached by men of old, both in and outside of the Bible. And Heavenly Father,